whether you recognized he was there or not. Amen. Um, this announcement's rather early, but go, you can go ahead and put it on your calendar. Is uh, Christmas this year is on Sunday. New Year's Day is on Sunday. Happens every seven years. I don't know about you, but Christmas, we got a Cooper family tradition on Sunday, on Christmas mornings. And so this year, we're not going to have church on Christmas Day and New Year's Day. Because I imagine you have your own traditions. And on New Year's Day, you'll probably end up not being here anyway because you stayed up watching the ball drop or some other thing and don't go to bed till like 2 o'clock. And when that alarm goes off at whenever you get up to get here at 10 o'clock, you're going to go, you know, I'm just going to stay home. So we're going to be proactive. You enjoy your families. One of those Sundays, probably New Year's Day, I won't do it Christmas Day, I'll probably go visit some other church but uh, or just stay and sleep in. Do whatever you want to do. But uh, we'll be so we'll be taking those breaks. So if you are trying to plan some family vacation or something else, then maybe that'll help you in uh, deciding what to do. So that's it. That's the announcements. Man, that was fun this morning. I enjoyed it. I appreciate our worship team pressing in and doing that spontaneous worship and spontaneous singing. And um, it's it's just fun. I love the worship here. And God is breaking through in worship all over this city. It's starting to happen. I really believe that the, that, uh, the move of God that we're wanting to see is going to be led by worship. It's, it's, they did that way in the Old Testament. Before they went out for battle, they would put the praise and worshipers in front. So, no matter how much I may pull on the praise and worship team and say, let's do this, do that, I'm not sticking you in front of an army that's going against another army that if you don't have the anointing, you die. Okay? It's, it's just... And so, uh, just keep that in mind. But I'm telling you, the worship this morning, it was intense, it was strong, but it's... We are in a war. And I'm just going to jump in here today. We are in a war. And so sometimes it just helps to, to be reminded of that. Realize it is a battle of light versus dark. And we are going to win. His kingdom's going forward. Sometimes it seems like it's going forward very slow. Sometimes it may even seem like it's going backwards slowly. But over the arc of history, it's going forward. <clears throat> At the time of the Apostle Paul's life, there was one Christian for every 368 people on earth. Today, at least professing, there is one Christian for every three people on earth. And moves of God are breaking out all over the place. You know, if you've been following the news, you've seen the uh, uh, all the protests and the people being killed in Iran. I read yesterday that God is moving stronger there than He's ever moved. That the underground church is moving forward. And so they are doing protests for women's rights. But I'm telling you, behind the scenes, it's the it's the uh, the principles of Christianity, it's the principles of the Bible, which is freedom, that is driving that thing. And we could go on and on, and it's happening. Xi Jinping, the the dictator over China, um, they estimate one one hundred million plus Christians in that country. Their number one fear there is freedom, and their number one. Th- Fear, or the number one thing that is driving freedom is Christianity and beliefs. They're getting free in their spirits. They're getting saved. Both places, Iran and China, are heavily persecuted. I don't want persecution, but one plus of persecution is it focus you, focuses you on what's important and gets the trivial out of your life and go, do I really want to be a Christian? Is it really worth it? And so it, it's their fear is Christianity there, but it's gone totally underground, and they're trying to snuff it out. They're putting pastors in both places. They don't even call them pastors because you can't do that. You made a target, but leaders. And I'm telling you, the kingdom of God is advancing. And before this is over with, there's only going to be one dictator, and his name is Jesus Christ. He's going to be a benevolent dictator, which means a good dictator, But all these other things are just imitations to try to forestall the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. 
bring in his kingdom. Well, what does kingdom mean? Kingdom is this, and we're all to advance his kingdom every day. So what does that mean? That means I live by the king's rules in my domain. I live by the king's rules and principles in my domain. Domain is my area of influence. And as we do that, it is spreading around the world. But the Western, the Western world, Australia, America, Canada, Western Europe, parts of Eastern Europe, is in a war right now. And for the, the moment, well, how is it in a war? It's in a war of philosophies and a war of religion. And right now, Christianity is losing that war because of behaviors we've done in the past as Christians. But it will turn around sometime in the future. The religion of of the West, those countries that I just mentioned, the the religion of the West is what's uh, used a big term called humanism. Humanism is simply this. Me as a human gets to decide what I do. Me as a human is the center. Me as a human rules my life by whatever I want to rule it by. Me as a human uh, is led predominantly even more as you get younger in the demographics by feelings, not truth. Truth is, it doesn't matter because I am the center of everything. And that is right now the predominant religion. You may say it's not a religion. But it is a religion, and we've made ourselves as a little G, God, as the center. And so humanism, whether you call it a philosophy or religion or whatever, is the predominant belief in the West. Well, how do you know this, Craig? All you got to do is go out on any social media, go out on any news sites, any self-help sites. What's the number one topics? They're all around how to be happy, because it's about me. How to be successful. How to, my rights. Offense is unbelievable how many people are offended. You're not offended unless you're making yourself the center of your thoughts and actions and behavior. And so humanism is the religion we get to decide. Now, we're going to talk about, we talked about it last week, but we're going to talk about it again. These, these words up here, there are three needs every human needs. It is created in you. You cannot get away from it. Ecclesiastes 3.11 says eternity has been written in the hearts of men. What does that mean? You're not just a byproduct of evolution. You don't just, you're not, you don't just have physical DNA. But when you're, that, that egg and that sperm came together and you were, you were conceived, you got your fit, everything you needed for your body was, was programmed in in DNA. It's an amazing technology. And so you got physical DNA. But at that same time, you don't get life until, until the Father breathes it into you. Just like he had to breathe life into Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve were created, but they didn't have life until you go back and read it, until, until he breathed into man. And when he breathed into that conception, you also got a spiritual DNA that parallels your physical DNA. And he said, this is, they're going to have a, a cry in their heart for eternity, something bigger than them. One reason our society is delving into more and more weird philosophies, more and more perverted behavior, is because they found just centering on me is not enough. Let's keep going further. And I'm here to tell you today that you will never find these three things, and we're going to hit on them, at least the first one today. I will continue talking about this every week. But you will never... See, it is in every man... When I say man, I mean man slash woman, mankind. It is humankind. It is in you to be accepted. Why? Because the base characteristic of the Father is love. And you are created in His image. You are not created in the image of a monkey or a protozoa or a cell or anything else. It is amazing how many scientists have rejected that because when you look at it, and you look at evolution, and you look at the facts, it's just absurd. It's just not going to happen. And so, 
when you, you are created in the image of the Father, His base characteristic is love. You were created for love. You were created to receive love, and you were created to give love. Why? Because that's what God the Father does, and you're created in His image. And so what the devil does is pervert this thing with humanism and says you will find love if you center in on yourself. Center in on your needs. Get your needs met. Get your success met. Get all this stuff, you know, three points to happiness met. Five points to a successful career. Some of that is good, but you will never feel accepted in yourself because you're not created that way. And that's why people get weird in their sexual relationships and go from this relationship to that relationship. They're trying to fill that need for unconditional love, and you will only get it from the person who created you. The answer to humanism to feel accepted, affirmed, which means encouraged, put on the right path, and assigned is is your calling over your life. The only way to do it is to first feel accepted, get encouraged, and then He gives you assignments. But the only way you're going to find that is outside of yourself. This is a key point if you get nothing else. Humanism focuses you on yourself. You can't get away from all the bombardment all day long. Likes, this, that, be successful, 15 minutes of fame. Those things are shallow and will never fulfill the ache in your heart for eternity. You can search all day long the rest of your life. Why do you think people have midlife crises? Because they've been doing it 35 to 50 years, and they realize this is not working. All the things that the humanism has told me to go after, it will never fulfill you. Never. Because you're not created that way. But when you get accepted by the Father, and we'll delve into this, and start going... You know how you get these three things met? You know how you get success met? You know how you get fame met? You know how you get whatever happiness met? Is to stop seeking it, die to seeking it, and going, I am going to get to know Father God. I'm going to get to know the God that created me. I'm going to get to know why did you create me. The only way you will ever know why you were created is to ask the Father. And He'll take you on a journey for it. Sometimes it's a long journey. Sometimes it's a short journey. He'll start going, this is why I created you. It says in Ephesians 2.10, before the foundation of the world. What does that mean? Before Adam and Eve were even created, I created for you. Turn to somebody around you. It says He's talking about you. I created you. Whether you believe in a young earth or an old earth, thousands of years ago before they were created... He said, I I created for you good works. That's the assigned part. But you're never going to... You can't jump straight to the assigned part or the good works. You have to go back to the Father, develop a relationship with Him, and say, I am going to die to my agenda. I'm going to die to my will because I trust you enough... That if I die to my agenda, if I die to my will, if I die to my needs, surely since you created me, you're a big enough God to re, to meet these needs. Once you start getting to know the Father's voice, there's this teaching that you often get in Christianity that says, uh, well, you can't meet God face to face. You can't hear His voice. You'll die. That's true if you don't have Holy Spirit inside of you. It's simple. People haven't thought through this. When you get saved, Holy Spirit comes inside of you. He's the third person of the Trinity. We often say, I want Jesus to come in my heart. And that's fine. Through Jesus, you get saved. Through Jesus, your sins are forgiven because He paid for them. But Jesus doesn't actually come and live in your heart. Holy Spirit does. So you already have God inside of you as close as you can get and you haven't died. And what Jesus said, He said, we know He came to die on the cross to forgive our sins, to save us from hell. But that's not what He said. He said, I have come to show you the Father. Our number one pursuit as Christians is not going to church, not doing everything right, not quitting 
cussing, chewing, and girl, going with girls who do. Or guys. It is to learn to hear His voice and to know the Father. Wake up every morning and go, Father, I want to know You. The Lord's Prayer starts out with this, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. And it goes on. Wake up every morning and go, Father, I want to know You and to hear Your voice, to even maybe see You. That happens. There's been people that smelled them. And see, the Holy Spirit inside of you will answer that prayer. He's your comforter when you need Him, but He's also your teacher to know the Father's voice. If you will give... Now, this is going to be hard, y'all. Y'all are going to hang on. I'm going to say it anyway. It goes against the philosophy of humanism. It goes against everything in the Western world. But I'm 62. I've had some success in some areas. And so I can verify this. Next year, I would have been following God for 50 years. I knew him from the womb. What can I say? No. So, is you simply give up your needs, agendas, and will. It's called bowing your knee to the cross. You have to die to live. And it doesn't make sense. It, go, it goes against everything we're taught in school. It goes against everything that's ingrained in us in life. If I don't, we say something, if I don't take care of myself, who's going to take care of me? It doesn't make sense. Why doesn't it make sense? You're natural. He's super natural. And when you die to your own will by getting up every day and say, Father, I submit myself to you. You show me where to go, how to do it, when to do it. He'll use your wisdom. He'll use your experience. You may hear something. You may not. But what you're doing is giving Him permission to move in your life. And then what doesn't make sense then makes sense because He brings in a different sense from the supernatural. And the world will think you're crazy. But let me tell you, as good as you are, as smart as you are, as clever as you and I are, and we are clever and smart and good. I mean, God didn't create junk. Would you, is it better to have God watching your back or are you constantly having to watch your back? I'm telling you, you can trust God. You can trust the Father. He will always have your back and your best. And when you first start doing this, it, it just scares the daylights out of you. He first did this when I was 13, so next year I'll be 63. There you go. And so I was 13 on the back row of a dead church that did not believe God spoke to you today. I was bored out of my mind. And you go, 13 is young. I'm telling you, God has spoken to many people and given them visions, insights, much younger than that. I was a slow learner. I was 13. I have an opened-eyed vision. What does that mean? I'm sitting here. It's almost like a movie playing right here. I didn't even believe these things could happen. The pastor that I'm listening to at this church would have said, you're listening to a demon and try to cast it out of you. But God wants relationship with us so bad. You are accepted by the Father, not because of what you do, not because of of doing everything right. You are accepted because you are His kid. You were created in His image. For those of you that have kids, how many times do they always do what is right? Do they ever do what's right? No, I didn't say that, did I? How many times do they always do what's right? Do you write them out of the will? Do you, quote, divorce them? Send them to foster care somewhere? No, they're still accepted. They just ain't doing right. And when they do right, you're proud of them. You're excited. But are they any more accepted? Nope. You don't give them any, you don't give them a higher percentage of the will. It's already written in there. That's how he is with him. Now see, this blows our mind. We're used to, because we're under the humanistic system, which is a demonic thoughts, 
It's the exact same system that was shown to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Two choices. It was real simple. He said, if you spend your life with me and eat from the tree of life, It was a physical tree, but it was symbolic. Get your instructions, agenda, guidance, and direction, self-esteem, acceptance from me. I will give you life. But if you decide to do your own thing and decide what is good or evil, death will come. Now, you think about this. When he said this to them, they did not even know what death was. They had no concept of what death is. Maybe they had some understanding, but they had never seen it. All of life comes down to two decisions every day, every minute, every hour. Am I going to decide what's good or evil? How many times have you heard people say, well, I've been good, I'm going to go to heaven? That's the opposite choice. I'm glad you're good. I'm glad you're not a murderer. I'm glad you're not robbing banks. I'm glad you're not cheating your brother and sister because that's evil. But good doesn't get you in heaven. Good, What gets you in heaven is a relationship with life. And if we will consistently choose Him, life always comes. And you go, that doesn't make sense. It doesn't. But He adds to the equation. One plus one equals two on earth. But if you got one natural person, you, one supernatural God, it equals a lot more than two. And people go, you seem like you're always blessed. You seem like you have God's favor. Things just break open for you and they don't happen. I go, I know. They go, how do you do it? I die. To my choice. And then he goes, well, I can work with that. But I was so stubborn. So here I was at 13. I mean, I wasn't into evil, okay? But I wasn't following God. And many of you have heard this story. He shows me a vision of me graduating at 18 years old from high school. Although I'm a slow learner. It could have been been kindergarten. In this case, it was high school. So this is five years ahead of time. I didn't even ask for this. This is the goodness of God. He he, He was trying to show me... If you die to your own will, because I was doing my own thing. I mean, it wasn't like I was selling drugs and killing people, but I was just doing my own thing. He showed me repeatedly, I saw the gym where we were having graduation for the gym that was not there at that time. It had not even been built yet. You have to know the history of our high school. I remember exactly what it looks like. Y'all know. Y'all spent your life there too. Showed me the gym. Showed me repeatedly going up and back. Up and back. Like, I don't know, in the dream, maybe three or four times, five times. Receiving awards. I just knew, because he just does that, I was getting more rewards than anybody else. Oh, this is cool. Then he... Because so... He was showing me I could do some things if I kept walking out on my own. Why? Because we're good. God's given us natural strength, natural wisdom. We, if we channel it right, we can do some cool things. But then he showed me, he, it's, I, it's hard to explain. I felt my emotions at the end of that thing. And I, I said to myself, is this all there is in life? I felt depressed, discouraged, and no drive for the future. I'm like, I've done all this stuff. I've accomplished it. It's not worth it. And then the Lord showed me. He says, I'm calling you to a different path. I'm asking you to run hard after me and never stop. That doesn't mean you're perfect. I've fallen many times, sinned many times, but you pick yourself back up. As it says in Proverbs, the righteous fall seven times, they pick them back up. That doesn't mean the eighth time you can stay there. It's a metaphor for keep going. Okay? It's like Jesus asked one of his disciples to forgive somebody. Do it 70 times seven. Again, it's a metaphor. When you get to 490 times, you don't, you can't stop forgiving them. <laughs> That's just in one day. And so he said, I want your life. He didn't promise anything. He just said, I want your life to follow hard after me for the rest of your life the best that you know how. And I felt the weight of it. And he said, if you don't, I'm not going to be walking with you anymore. 
I think I would have kept my salvation. I'm really not sure what that means. But, it, but you know, sometimes we're just so... If you, I don't know if you're like me. I'm, I'm a very hard-headed person. Very opinionated person. I've tried to go low, but it's, it's just hard. I mean, any of you guys like that? I was a slow learner. It took me four days of wrestling with God to finally say yes. How many of y'all been through that wrestle? And we often have to do it over and over again. Now, this is what's cool here. Many of you have heard this story, but I'm going to... There's a lot of new people I'm sure haven't heard it. What happened to me at 18 on my graduation? Everything I saw in my dream happened. I got more awards than anybody else. Did that thing back and forth. Doesn't matter the details. And I remembered that dream or that open-eyed vision from five years earlier. This time, I was like, this is cool. But this is, I'm, but I didn't draw life from it. I said, this is cool that this happened. He did it anyway, but this time there was none of the residual baggage that I was trying to draw life from the things he blessed me with. And I said, this is cool. It's been fun. What's next? And it's been that way for ever since then, decades. I'm telling you, whatever you give up for God, He will owe no man. He will owe no man. You die to something, before it's over with, He will pay you back. He will owe no man. And it will be with interest in multiples. And so, if any wrestles you're at, The world is telling you, fight for your rights. Fight for this. Fight for fame. Fight for... I'm telling you, it is a formula that does not work. You will spend your whole life fighting. And if you start out young, when you're 35 to 50, wherever you hit the the midlife crisis, why do you think people have midlife crises? Because they were going in the wrong direction. It's as simple as that. They were trying to get life from something that cannot have life. It's the same lie that was given to the de- to Adam and Eve by the devil. He comes to him, going back to the story earlier, two trees. He said, you can be as God. I'm paraphrasing. You can decide for yourself what to do. Yeah, I know God said this, but you can decide for yourself what to do. They started the pattern that has multiplied through all of humanity since then. They decide, okay, we will be like God. What does that mean? I with a little g as opposed to a big g will decide the direction for my life. <coughs> when they did that, God allows you to do it every day. He allows me to do it every day. He allowed them to do it. You get disconnected from the life source. And you forget you your life cannot be sustained at the level that you want by yourself. It's impossible. You are not created that way. I don't care how many chandras you do and um, ohms you do and meditate that you do in Eastern religion. What you're seeking inside of you is simply not there. But you feel something eternal is there. But it's not the way you go. You die to yourself and you run to the Father like the prodigal son story. You run to the Father and He goes, I got a peace for you. Then when you do biblical meditation, then when you do biblical studies, he deposits that peace in there of, of, to fill up that, <coughs> that, that spiritual DNA in, there, DNA in there. And once you start connecting with the Father, there's an acceptance that happens that you could never get anywhere else. You get accepted through humility. You go low to go high, to use that catchphrase. And so every day I challenge you, your meaning, your acceptance, your... Let me just pause here. There is much shame and guilt in the world. Maybe even in... Even though this is a small congregation, even this size, there's going to be shame and guilt and regrets. 
When you run to the Father and, and start hearing His voice, He starts wiping out the shame, the guilt, and the regrets. You go, how does that happen? He's super. And He marries with your natural. And He takes it out that no amount of psychology, earning, counseling sessions can get you there. Let me just real quick just summarize from Luke 15. I'm not going to take the time to read it because I'm only going to go another four or five minutes. Uh, the, I love the prodigal son story. It's a story that's almost we've heard so many times that we, we forget the significance of it. So there was a father that had two sons. One of them said, more than ever, I'm going to decide what's good and evil, and I want my half of the inheritance. As you read that, he already had the inheritance. The Father had already given it to him. Each one of you in here already have an inheritance from the Father, whether we realize it or not. But we don't know how to use it unless we're connected with the Father, because He's the one that got it for us. Anyway, He takes it, spoils it, spends it on women, wine, song, whatever else He did. Until all the money was gone because he didn't know how to steward it because his life connection was cut. He said, I'm going to decide what is right and what is wrong. That's what Craig does if he's not careful on a daily basis and squander the life that God's given us and the inheritance that God's given us. Anyway, he comes back, ends up feeding the pigs because he ran out of money and that's the only way he could eat. He'd eat the food from the pigs. How many of you... Oh, you don't have to raise your hand. How many, either you or you have met people that are going, they're living not in a physical pigsty, but the metaphorical pigsty after running so hard for happiness and acceptance. And we've all done it to some degree or another. And we, we, we pick up the consequences of that. I'm here to tell you, you will have a better life than you can ever imagine if you give up your life. Well, I want to do this and I want to do that. Well, that might be God's will for you. It might not. But whatever His will is for you, it will be better than what you can dream of because that dream doesn't come when you ask. That dream was put in you when He breathed on you. Why? Because it says in Ephesians 2.10, I created you beforehand good works that, that uh, you, you will follow me and do. The dream, if you give up a dream, I've had to give up dreams, many of them. But what happens is, if it's truly His dream, He will bring it about without all the striving and trying. If it's not His dream, He will ignite the dream He put in you, and it will be better than the dream that you came up with, and you'll go, I was made for this. And yet I didn't even realize it. But the Father uncovered it. So anyway, the prodigal son comes. What does he do? He did these three things over the prodigal son. And you can go back and read it in, in Luke 15. It's a great read. He did three things for him. Accepted him, affirmed him, and assigned him by the physical acts that he did. He gave him a robe. Now for us, we don't wear robes, okay? Back then though, robes were indicative of your standing and of your wealth status of your job and the family that you were a part of. This guy still got pig junk all over him. Who knows how long he had taken a bath. And so, he's a picture of us. If you've sinned, you have regrets, you have shame, don't try to get them off and go to the Father. You'll never get them off. You just spread the dirt around. You're just sitting there spreading it around. Maybe you get it off your eyes and you think it's gone. You run to the Father, and He's going to put a robe on you that says, this is my child. You are my son. You are my daughter. And you're part of my family. And He starts cleaning you up. How do we get rid of shame and regret? Don't try to get rid of shame and regret. Just run to the Father. Now, there's a lot of people you may run across at your work or in your family that you know they have shame regret, guilt. Just pray that the Lord gives you an opportunity and says the best way to take this off 
is to get back to that eternity that's inside of your heart. The best way is to run back to the Father. If they're not saved, show them how. If they are saved, show them just, it's just simply just say, Father, I've run back to you. That's all the prodigal son had to do was run back. Help people get rid of shame. It's not by what they do. It's by who they know. And then he gave them a ring, which was the ring in that time was a symbol of a, of a identity. When people saw that ring, it said, well, he can do this. He can do that. We don't have that tradition these days. But that's what they did back then. And that's why he affirmed them. He put a robe on and said, you're accepted. You're in the family. Not because of what you've done, but because you've run to the Father. I now give you this ring, which affirms you. I'm going to use you. You're, uh, you're, you're, my will will be done in your life. I will restore you. Unfortunately, as human beings, I know I've been this way. You've seen people around you. It's simple. Just turn back to the Father and these things start happening. But what we typically do is we have to run to the very end of even our own destruction before we'll go low. Don't wait till circumstances make you low. Go low now. It says humble yourself now. Then he'll start putting that robe on you. The ring. The third thing he gave him was sandals. Sandals meant he was going someplace. He needed some shoes. I don't know how all that, how he was assigned. So I want you to stand and I'm just going to pray over you. So today, I just challenge you that your destiny is walking in his destiny. And then as you go low and say, I'm not concerned about my destiny. He shows you that His destiny, follow me, that He put in you at conception, that He said, I'm, their assignment, this is part of their assignment, is to help me in my destiny, which is actually their destiny. And then you have a destiny not just to be happy, make money, drive nice cars, la, la, la. Your destiny is to bring the kingdom all around you, and it will give you the biggest joy you've ever had. He'll make sure you have every resource you need. People, finances, wisdom. Why? Because it's not about your destiny. It is your destiny, but it's His destiny that He put inside of you. And He's going to make sure He gets it done and He's found somebody that's going to help Him. Jesus at 12 got this. Remember, His family left after Passover. They were three days down the road. And they go, where's Jesus? They had to backtrack for three days. So now they're six days back to where they already were. I'd be ticked as a parent. And you can tell it when you look through there. They were a little ticked. You could read it between the lines. And they go, what are you doing? This dude's 12 years old. He said, I'm about my father's business. He had already learned how to be accepted, affirmed, not caring about what other people think. When you get offended, it means you're getting your affirmation from people. As you spend time with the Lord every day in in His presence, you become unoffendable. I mean, that's a word, isn't it? But he knew his assignment already. I don't know what he was talking about with those guys. But he was talking about to the high priests and the priests and the Pharisees and all those people. And it says they were astounded at his wisdom at 12. He hadn't even been to rabbi teaching yet. That was to come. I think it started at 12 or 13, something like that. That's cool. Father, I thank you for every person here. And I thank you that you are raising people up that are passionately in love with you. And I thank you, Father, for healthy people in this room. Spirit, soul, and body. And it comes because they're eating from the tree of life, which is your voice your words. As Deuteronomy 28 says, if you will listen to my voice and obey my commands, then from verse 2 to verse 14 is all these things He's going to do for you. It's as simple as that. Listen to my voice. Obey my commands. And so today, we say to you, Father, to the best we know how, we know we won't do it perfectly, but we'll repent and come back. Today, we say we 
we listen to your voice. We obey your commands the best we know how, and you give us strength. And we, because we want to eat from the tree of life, which is you. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And use that word, not, not just haphazardly. And so today we choose the way of listening to your truth. And we thank you. I thank you for every person here. Your life is growing in them. It's getting stronger in them and multiplying. So that your life becomes our life. And what we thought was life is replaced by a better vision, a better life. And Father, I just, I just say in Jesus' name, bless these people as they go out to hear you better than they've ever heard before. In Jesus' name, amen.